Simon Magus, part two. Then, surrounded by his escort, he would himself begin to preach. Worn out by the apostle's words of wisdom, the crowd was less than eager to gather round. We've seen of Paul and John, they would say to him. We've had enough words for a year. I am not an apostle, Simon would say. I am one of you. They place their hands on your heads to inspire you with the Holy Ghost. I hold out my hands to raise you up from the dust. Whereupon he would lift his arms skywards, his white sleeves sliding down in graceful folds to reveal a pair of beautiful white hands and the fine fingers found only among idlers and illusionists. They offer you eternal salvation, Simon would go on. I offer you knowledge and the desert, and who so wish may join me. The people were used to every kind of wanderer from every direction, though mostly from the east, now alone, now in purse, now accompanied by a crowd of believers. Some left their some left their mules and camels outside the village or at the foot of the mountain or in the next valley. Others arrived with an arms escort, and their sermons were more like threats or play acting. Still the road in on their mules and without even dismounting, launched into acrobatic tricks. But for the past fifteen years or so, since the death of a certain Nazarene, the visitors have tended to be young and healthy, with carefully trimmed beards, or no beards at all, and wore white cloaks, carried shepherd's staffs, and called themselves apostles and sons of God. Their sandals, their sandals were dusty from the long journey, their words so much alike they seemed to be Sorry. Their words, their words, so much alike they seem to have been learned from the same book. They all referred to the same miracle, which they had themselves witnessed. The Nazarene had turned water into wine before their eyes and fed a large crowd with a few sardines. Some claimed to have seen him. No. Some claim to have seen him rise up to the sky in a dazzling light and reach heaven like a dove. The blind, whom they brought with them as living witnesses, claimed that the light has taken away their sight but given them spiritual enlightenment. And they all call themselves Son of God and Sons of the Son of God. For a chunk of bread or a jug of wine, they promised bliss and life everlasting. And when the people chased them, them from their doors, setting their fierce dogs upon them, the preachers threatened them with an everlasting hell, where their flesh would burn over a low flame like a lamp on the spit. There were, however, fine speakers among them, men who knew how to give the suspicious crowds and the even more suspicious authorities answers to numerous complex questions concerning not only the soul but the body, animal house boundary and farming. They cured young men and pimples and instructed young girls in the hygiene of preserving their virginity and bearing it more easily. They counseled the elderly about preparation for death about what words to utter at a mortal hour and how to cross the ramps to slip through the narrows leading to the light. They told mothers how to save their prodigy without expensive sorceries and potions and how to keep their son from going to war. They taught barren women clear and simple prayers to say three times a day on an empty stomach so that the Holy Ghost, as they call it, might make them wombs fruitful 